Now, Alex and her team in the Scotland East Aspirations have provided feedback from, from you guys and your peers, which have informed us that some uh, are currently uncertain as to what that progression pathway actually looks like. So we listened to that request and, and here we are with RGU, Robert Gordon University, to help dispel some of that uncertainty. So we as AT practitioners and educators wanted to reinforce the message that full chartered membership should be on your career pathway as an architectural technologist and that it's not too difficult or too complicated. So our speakers today will be talking about their pathway from AT education to AT industry, why they decided uh, to apply for full chartered membership, their experiences of working through the chartership process, including complying with the framework, advice and guidance for those considering starting the process of full membership and resources that are available to ATs. So uh, I am honoured today and extremely grateful to all of our speakers for volunteering their time from their very busy schedule to provide us with this context on becoming a member of CIAT. Now, each of our speakers will take about 10 or 15 minutes each. So uh, in order of speaker, we have Jamie Yorkson, who is MCIAT, joining us from Cummings & Co. Jamie is an RGU alumni, 2014. He worked at Inspired Designs and Developments for eight years, completed his chartership in 2017, and now, spends the last, and now spent the last two years as the technical manager at Cummings & Co. Next up, Oliver, um, MC, Oliver Hibbs, MCIAT. He's joining us from Sumner McDonald Architects. He's an RGU alumni, 2012. Uh, with qualifications and certification from Passive House and University of West England. Worked at Bon Accord uh, for three years, then Smith, Scott and Mullen Associates for uh, six years, and now spent the last five months as a senior <laughs> architectural technologist at Sumner MacDonald Architects. Then we'll hear from Alison Mitchell, ACIAT, joining us from EMA Architects, uh, Architecture and Design, alumna from Forth Valley College in 2005, worked as an AT for 11 years at Roy Mitchell Designs Limited, then moved to Persimmon Homes for a year, and then has worked at EMA for the last eight years and has recently um, been promoted up to uh, Associate Director. So finally, uh, and adding his unique magic to all of our star lineup today is Dr. Jonathan Scott, a fellow member of CIAT and RG alumni 1998, completing his PhD in environmental sustainability in 2004 and spent the last 16 years delivering AT research and delivering the AT undergrad program at RGU, uh, including leading and securing that coveted CIAT Centre of Excellence Award for the institution. And Jonathan is joining us today to, uh, uh, to provide some additional context and perspective for, as an ambassador for the Architects Benevolent Society, and will describe some of the ABS services that they offer to ATs. So my thanks again to all of our speakers for, for taking their time today. So, Jamie, uh, but yeah, thanks for having me along today. Um, uh, as John mentioned, uh, architecture technologist um, was chartered in 2017, um, and yeah, more recently I was uh, working uh, coming in co uh, as an architectural technologist. Um, so in the next kind of 10, 15 minutes or so, um, just a bit of a background on myself, um, how I progressed um, from a student member then into an associate member and thereafter um, as a full chartered member um, and just a wee bit of, of kind of feedback I suppose and a bit of guidance on how I managed to achieve that um, and as obviously some of the feedback um, that's been, been provided as it can be a wee bit confusing I suppose so um, how, I, how I dealt with that. Um, a bit about my own personal development and opportunities that have um, arisen from mostly being uh, a student at RGU and then becoming involved with the Institute. Um, 
then on to some completed projects and some ongoing projects that I'm working on just to kind of give you an idea of, of the day-to-day -day, um, life that I have. So a bit of background on me. Um, I think there might actually be some uh, people in the call today that might even have featured in this uh, these two photos, uh, Jonathan being one of them. Um, but yeah, I attended Mac Academy in St Haven, so I've not really moved away that far. Um, Whole kind of 15 miles into to, to Aberdeen. Um, applied for uh, architecture technology in 2010, um, and uh, yeah, it was obviously the, the, the four-year course there. Um, and then in 2013, we obviously had the opportunity in uh, semester one to get uh, our semester two, sorry, to get our placement, um, in which I landed a placement at Inspired Design and Development in Stonehaven, um, and that was a, a kind of six month placement that then led me into full time employment and they actually kept me employed uh, over my final year, which made printing very cheap, which was great. Um, and then in 2014 um, was when I graduated and managed to achieve a first class honours degree. Um, thereafter, I worked full time at Inspired Design and Development, um, which I'll, I'll speak a little bit um, about how that obviously assisted me becoming chartered. Um, and then the same week that I became chartered, I uh, then appointed the Aspirations Chair, which I've recently stepped down from, which is now Alex that's uh, leading that. Um, a similar time to that, I was getting involved with the teaching side of things at, at RGU, which I'm still involved with, albeit it's been over at Teams kind of for the past year or so. Um, currently working at Coming Co, as I've mentioned, and then still involved with CIAT in a new role, um, which again I'll speak to a wee bit about as we go through. Um, so yeah, why did I why did I join? I kind of fell into uh, AT uh, by default, really. Always intrigued um, and interested in the technical drawing side of things at, at, at school, um, and then obviously found a course that aligned with that, um, which was um, was at AT at, at RGU, um, and straight from there became rather passionate about it. Um, and it's these kind of details, um, you know, that might take you days or weeks to work up um, that, that, that kind of keeps me interested and keeps me keeps me focused every day. Um, these are ones that I've also done at university, but also we're producing similar information now um, that actually goes out and gets built. So student life for me, um, I, was, I guess I was quite involved. I came um, probably a wee bit of a swat, a wee bit geeky, um, and uh, yeah, try to attend and get involved in as, as much events as possible. Um, the photo that's on the right there is obviously of a, a recent um, AGM, um, which is uh, all to do with the CIAT and um, their yearly event there. Um, but my involvement with CIT um, obviously started as a student, was going along to some of the events that they um, would arrange, which was mainly CPD events um, with meetings thereafter. But that also allowed me to um, meet a lot of the, the local rep representatives that are still involved today um, and that have been obviously leading um, Scotland East region, but also um, involved in, in the running of the whole institute um, and advising on a lot of important matters that, that, um, that, that happen. Um, the award side of things is something that I've been um, been interested in, not just within RGU, but um, launching that as, a, as an AT specific award through the Aspirations Group, um, which you'll be hearing more about um, as as the, uh, the AT awards this year gets uh, promoted. So a bit of a diagram there on how I also ended up working towards becoming chartered. Um, so obviously I got my placement in 2013. Um, was kept on through my final year and then into 2014 and um, started working full time at Inspired Design and Development. Um, very small practice, mainly domestic projects. Um, but the, the, there were other services and other projects that, that we worked on, but it was mainly that domestic sector. So small extensions, one off new builds, small developments, um, which gave me kind of the best steer, I suppose, or the best opportunity to start working through um, the um, the, the application to become charged through the, the professional assessment. Um, I did, however, I did start working on the pop record, but it was actually through going to one of these similar events um, in which I kind of 
veered away from that because my, my, my place of work was so aligned with carrying out this professional assessment route. Um, so there are a few different ways to become chartered um, in which you might need to discuss um, the, the, the options with the likes of myself, John, Jonathan, um, anyone really that's got an involvement with CIT you should be able to, to give you a bit of guidance. Um, but to, to essentially achieve all these things, there was the three, the three kind of main driving factors, which was everything I'd learned at university, working in practice with Inspired Design and Development, which gave me the projects to, to allow me to see this full, full um, process from you know, the pricing element of a job to, to the handover and completion of a project. Um, and then obviously my associate membership um, with CIAT allowed me to obviously start progressing. Um, so the main starting point, I think, for anyone that's beginning to question um, or are intrigued about uh, becoming uh, a chartered member would be to get onto the CIAT website um, Hopefully most of you are student or associate members, which you'll be able to get access then to the documents that they have on there and download this document that's on the left there, um, which probably will look a bit daunting to start with because um, there's a lot of information in it um, and a lot of blank spaces in it for you to start completing, um, which like I say, is a wee bit daunting. Um, but once you start actually um, looking at the projects that you're working on, you'll actually be quite surprised, um, you know, how your, uh, your your application will fill up. Um, what you also need to do is provide evidence. So um, everything from sketches to notes from meetings, to planning applications to build and more information. Um, so all these things become part of your evidence-based um, application. It's all online now as well. Um, so you're basically just creating a, a, a kind of a, a stockpile of documents and drawings and information, um, as well as this written document the second part um, is the, the professional standards framework. So there's the three key headings in which you need to meet um, and, and kind of show evidence to and explain how each project would, uh, would basically tick these off. So there's a few different ways you can go about it, but I basically picked a project per heading because um, I had, had those kind of projects um, kind of on file, if you like. Um, and I actually queued a few of them up when, you know, when I sat down with my previous boss and um, spoke about becoming chartered and how I would achieve that. So it was quite nice to take a few years to actually, um, you know, collate this information. Um, I maybe could have done it a wee bit quicker, but um, personally, I just wanted to make sure that I was, you know, uh, you know kind of well-rounded, I suppose, to, to be able to progress on. So these are a few images of, of, of the projects that I use. Um, they weren't the most fancy projects, they weren't the highest value projects, um, but each of them had a, a kind of interesting element that would kind of link back to the, the kind of three key headings from the, from the professional framework. Um, so this was an extension um, in Stonehaven. Um, like I say, it wasn't, wasn't the most expensive at all. Um, I think the sunny pictures um, help it look uh, that wee bit more attractive. Um, but again, it was, it was a full design phase that we had. So right from the moment the client was looking to get an extension through the planning, through the bill of warrant, through all the issues that we found on site um, and then to the, the kind of completion and handover side of things. So I could basically provide the evidence all the way through of how the design developed um, right from the concepts um, to, to get in that completion certificate at the end. Um, and I basically had a step-by-step -step guide, if you like, on, on how I designed that project and managed it. Um, the second one here is a house I'd done up in, uh, in Tarvis. Um, the reason I picked this one for the managing side of things is because I had an absent client. They actually lived overseas and were moving back to the UK to to live in this house, <clears throat> which has an element of uh, kind of complexity when you're trying to manage a client's expectation from another country uh, when they work full time and they like to discuss things over the evenings or the weekends. So um, it was quite quite full on. Um, they also had a two year window where they wanted to build this house, so it wasn't a traditional pass the, the drawing to the contractor and sign up to you know, a 50 week build or something like that. It was it was dragged out quite substantially. So um, it wasn't the most smooth running project either. So I actually had a lot to speak about when it came to the actual the interview side of things. Um, and then the third one um, was a, a replacement uh, horse riding facility for Aberdeen Riding Club. And um, it's essentially a large shed with lots of stables in it and a riding school in it. 
um, <clears throat> excuse me, but for the practicing side of things, um, it was quite uh, quite challenging because we had essentially various different clients. Um, there was the end user, but there was also various stakeholders who were funding the project. Um, so that had quite a tricky um, kind of client base, if you like, that we had to report back to. It wasn't just the owner of the, the building that we were reporting back to. Um, so again, it was quite a complex um, project in terms of the practicing side of things. And we had to ensure that we were reporting back to the right people all the way through. Um, and it also changed clients from the planning side of things to the actual construction side. So again, there was a lot to speak about on that. So it's very much trying to align your projects with um, these kind of um, the, the three standards that are mentioned in the in the framework and, and make it quite interesting, I suppose. So for the actual submission, um, like I say, it's, a, it's an online submission that you do. You're basically creating this, uh, this, this file of information. You've got your your written document um, as part of the submission and all the evidence. So um, that's the bit that actually takes quite a while is collating all this information from projects that you might have worked on for you know, um, however many years that you've been in practice. Um, so that, uh, and referencing that in the text can take quite a, quite a while. But once you get there, it's an online submission. <clears throat> Hopefully your, your place of work pays for your online submission and pay for all your fees. Um, mine certainly did, and it, and it made it just that bit more um, straightforward to, to achieve. You then sign up to an interview board. So mine was in Manchester. Um, so I got a day day trip to Manchester, which was um, rather nerve wracking, flying down to somewhere I'd never been um, and sitting, uh, waiting for my interview whilst various other members came in and out and seen, seen those other members pass. And I'm sitting there waiting patiently to get in. Um, Roughly 45 minutes for the interview. Mine dragged on for a while, but it was just because we, we we spoke about loads of things, and it was and it was um, ended up going a wee bit more informal than I thought it might have been. But they can basically question you on anything that's in your your written submission. They don't get to see the evidence, so I actually took a printed submission with me um, to actually you know be able to explain certain drawings or certain things that they 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 were kind of looking for for more information on. Um, which you don't have to do take a printed submission, but um, it certainly helped me on the day because I could actually, you know, um, show them drawings or show them correspondence that was uh, that, that that formed part of my submission. Um, and then uh, you, you then get invited to kind of wait for your um, the kind of verdict on if you've passed or not. Um, so back out into the hotel foyer um, and, and kind of wait 15 minutes or so, um, which feels like a lifetime, but. Um, on the day I got confirmed that, that I was passed um, and that I would now be a full um, chartered member. Um, but I was reminded because at that stage um, I, I, I still felt quite young and quite new into the industry. Um, so, you know, they, they, they said, you know, this isn't the uh, the end of your career. You know, you need to still keep learning and, and keep attending all these different events to, to keep your, your, your knowledge current and expanding as well. Um, so a bit on, I guess, my personal development and opportunities that have, that have arisen from becoming chartered, from uh, being a student at, uh, at RGU um, and getting involved with the, with the, the, the local um, aspiration side of things, but also the, the local region. Um, so these are a few uh, kind of photos of the more glamorous side, I suppose. Um, there's the AT awards that happen yearly, albeit this year it's going to be um, a kind of remote. Um, the, the in-house RGU awards, um, and then the kind of the, the centre right photo. Um, I actually got invited to do a conference in India, um, which was fully funded by CIAT, um, which was an incredible trip, a very short trip to India. Um, but yeah, got to got to meet some some other members from CIAT from all around the world, but also meet um, people representatives from government and also from universities. Um, in, in India as well. So that was a, a real honour to get to do that. And then just very briefly, because um, I think I'm slightly over time, um, just some of the projects that I've, I've worked on um, and currently working on. So um, these are some of the completed houses that I've done um, in, in my previous practice, um, essentially one-off new builds um, with really great clients with um, with, with, with quite healthy budgets, um, which allowed some really, really nice designs to get put together and, and quite high spec houses, which which were great. 
Um, a bit more on the kind of non-domestic side, um, some of these buildings you might you might recognise. Um, one of the, the bottom left was the, the AstroTurf pitches at Stonehaven, which my old practice we actually done um, free of charge for the community. Um, so that was something that I never thought really work on was a football pitch. Um, not necessarily invited, you know, interested in football, but I had to learn quite a lot to to develop the, the drawings for those. And then again, just very very briefly, some of the ongoing projects. Um, this is a hotel project I'm working on up in Inverness at the moment. Um, this is something that um, that I've done in Revit. So when I uh, left my previous job, I had no idea how to use Revit. Um, I have to give credit to the people in the office here, um, especially Hazel who's behind me, but she's probably blurred out because um, I've asked probably thousands of questions on how to develop uh, drawings in Revit, but it's due for completion quite soon. We were just up two weeks ago taking photos of one of the sample rooms, which you can see bottom right. Um, but that's just a wee bit of a kind of timeline or a wee bit of a system of how we've developed, you know, from the existing building through the, the Revit model, through the construction phase and then hopefully nearing completion. Um, one of the other projects we're working on, this is due on site quite soon, it's a hotel down in Plymouth. So from Inverness right down to Plymouth, we, we, we cover kind of all those areas um, and that's due to be on site uh, end of this month and, and complete in a year's time. And lastly, another project which is actually in Acton in London. Um, so yeah, again, uh, the other end of the country, um, but it's uh, it's at the planning stages at the moment um, and going out to, to contender quite soon. Um, and just a wee bit on support, basically. Um, so obviously we've uh, this is a group that we're we're involved with today, um, but there's there's a lot of support out there, and you know I think the the, the support is growing um, for. Uh, people that want to become chartered like i say it was quite confusing at the start for me when i jumped out of university and was in the was in the industry and um, i think i would always go to jonathan um and he was probably always on at me to actually start progressing things but probably just a wee bit lazy at that point and didn't really know where to go so please just get in touch by any of those uh those kind of means noted to the left add me on linkedin um i think some of your students have probably taught so um yeah, just, uh, just just get in touch. Um, I'd be delighted to have questions and assist anybody that wants to progress. Oliver, I am a graduate of RGU from 2012, way, way back. I was going to try and dig out a picture of um, me and Jonathan, but you'll see that I've changed a lot. Jonathan hasn't changed a bit since then, actually, rather scarily. Um, I just graduated back in 2012 um, and as um, John said in his introduction there, I started working fairly soon after at a, a stone supply company, North Aberdeen, what's Aberdeen famous for? Granite. So um, I thought I'd um, start off my career there working in um, building stone and doing sort of everything from offices to private houses, lots of sort of intricate details from um, granite suppliers in China who would ship it over and then um, it get built on site. So it was a good introduction to the construction industry, I suppose, um, by getting out on site and actually talking with, you know, joiners and builders and seeing how things actually go together on site. Um, Sorry, Oliver, uh, don't yes. mean to interrupt, but uh, we can't see your slides. Oh, OK. I, I thought I was sharing it. Can you see them now? No. Oh, it's all gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Sorry, Oliver. I, I mean, just realised that you were quite deep into your slides and if you yeah. seen anything, I thought I'd better, better step in. How about now? Can you see a lovely image of Edinburgh? It can, yes. It has the um, it has the control, pa the control bars yes. along the top and side, though. Yes. Yes, there we go. Uh, how about now? Still has the control bars, but now we can see your slides. Are they moving on? Don't know. Not yet. Right. No. Okay. Oh, oh it's yes. awesome. Right. Okay. We'll do it this way. I was, I was trying to be too clever. That's the problem. Um, I mean, you wouldn't think I've been doing this for more than a year now, would you use in Teams? But you know, it still goes wrong. Anyway, as I was saying, I've um, been working in um, Building Stone up in Aberdeen, um, doing commercial residential level stuff, um, all very interesting. Um, and then in 2015, decided to make the big move from Aberdeen down to Edinburgh and start working at Smithcote Marlon and doing lots of interesting projects. This was a gym 
an extension to a gym at Napier University at Site Hill, which um, some of you may be familiar with. And the completed project looked remarkably like the visuals, which is always nice. Um, got to do some small residential um, work as well. This is a little, well, not a little, actually, uh, a double house extension to a lovely little muse lane in Edinburgh um, with a very nice bathroom that I took far too long working on. And um, I've also done some work with um, historic buildings. So this was the previous Harbour Master's office in Stranraer, which we did a, a nice little extension to. Um, and before I left Miss Scotland and moved to Sunderland MacDonald, where I am now, I'd started working in Passive House. So um, developing the project or the Praxis First Passive House project sort of to planning stage and doing some lovely drawings to go along with it. Um, and through my sort of five and a half years at SSM, I thought, right, I, I need to get chartered. I thought, why do I need to get chartered? It's the sort of the, the next logical step in my career as I saw it. Um, it's it's um, a way of obtaining more responsibility, I suppose, and um, representing CIAT and becoming more involved with the Institute in the region more locally, I suppose. Um, so I thought, right, OK, how do I go about getting chartered? Um, first of all, having done it, I would say it's not nearly as daunting as you might think going into it. You might have um, already downloaded the professional assessment document, started re reading through it, and as Jamie said, it's just lots of blank spaces which you've got to fill in. And then you look at some of the exemplars and you think, oh my goodness, this is an awful lot of work. And it is a lot of work, but it's it's not nearly as daunting as you might think. And I would say before you even get started in working through the document, get yourself a referee and a mentor identified um, and start talking to them about what you want to get out of the process, I suppose. Ultimately, that's to become chartered, but how you want to go about it. Um, your referee can be any of these, any person with these qualifications, but I mean, typically a lot of people use chartered architectural technologists as their referees because they've already been through the process, um, which is logical. And I was the first um, AT to become chartered at Smith Scott Mullins, so there wasn't one of those for me, unfortunately. Um, but thankfully, um, one of the more senior staff had been a, a part three architecture mentor for um, lots of people previously. So he was he was quite a, a useful person to have as a, a mentor um, and a, a referee. And I would say the most important thing you can do is talk to other chartered members like me and um, just to get a bit more of an idea about the process. Um, and obviously that's what events like this are for to sort of get a bit of a better idea about the process. And I don't think it's actually on the slide, it's not no, but the second most important thing you can do, I think, is get a, a buddy to go through it with. What I did as I was going through it um, was there were a few of us in the practice wanted to get chartered at the same time. So rather than one person going it alone, it was three of us, we would meet up regularly and bounce ideas off of each other. And it just made it a whole lot easier and made it a lot easier to be motivated when you've got someone else saying, oh, what did you do for this? What did you do for that? Um, and it just sort of makes it a bit more of a classroom environment, I suppose, where you can progress together and sort of all move towards the same goal. And um, I'll maybe skip through this fairly quickly, but as Jamie sort of broke down his presentation, it's broken down into lots of different sections. Sections A to E is effectively a CV as I wrote it, um, of who you are, what you've done, and how you do it. Um, if you look at Section F, which is educational standards, if you've studied at RGU, ENU, or UHI, you don't have to complete that because your degree will have completed it for you. Um, the, main, the main body of work for the assessment is the practice standards which as Jamie went through is broken down into designing, managing and practicing and developing self which is effectively CPD and personal development and um, looking at designing it's sort of expanding on your role and how you design within your within your work 
and how you contribute to that. For me, it's the longest section just because I spoke about, I think, four different projects and my involvement with them at various stages because I wasn't sort of lead designer on any of them, but I was able to talk about how I designed in various different ways. And um, to give some examples of evidence, I mean, you can, I, I believe you can justify anything as evidence as long as it's, it's relevant. I mean, I put in, I submitted sort of, um, overmarks of drawings and drawings that I'd commented and checked on and um, where we'd had timber kit manufacturers drawings where we'd gone back and said no this isn't quite right you need to do it like this and um, also things like meeting records and emails even emails telephone records as long as you redact all of the sensitive information then um, it all sort of helps tell the story of you and what you do um, with regards to managing, I think it's useful to not just talk about how you might manage a project, but how you manage your time as well. Um, so at Smith Scott Mullen, where I was previously, it was a good opportunity to talk about the, the pretty um, rigorous time management that's um, put in place how fortnightly there's a, a, um, a programming meeting where everyone sort of sits down and finds out what they're going to be working on for the week and projects are reported on. And how you might manage your own time or manage other people's time. Uh, it's also a good opportunity to talk about not only the good things that you do, but the bad things that happen on site and how you manage them. For example, there was one um, example I used where um, on a large housing project, so the, um, the contractor had installed the windows in the wrong position because as it turned out, the timber kit manufacturer had built them in the wrong position and no one had noticed until I was walking around on site, looked up and said, good God, what is that? Um, and then I was able to take that, that rather um, scary moment on site to um, actually then sort of learn about why the mistake happened, how it could be avoided in the future, but also sort of have the, the paper trail of um, what I did to sort of manage the situation, I suppose. And that's exactly the sort of thing they're looking for. Um, and there's some examples of it. There we go. I forgot to put those in. Um, practicing was um, an opportunity for me to talk about just one project and taking it from the, the start to the end of the project and um, the issues that were brought up. Um, throughout the course of the project, which for this one was, I think, about three years, just because it was a bit of a, a slow project. Um, but it lets you um, sort of take a, a deeper dive into one project, or as I did anyway. Um, and sort of, as I say, dive a bit further into the detail of it and how you go about the daily running of a project. Um, and again, yes, I evidence-wise, basically, it, I think anything can be relevant. I've got here, I've got meeting records and um, things like uh, documents that I prepped before going to site so that I could walk around on the site visit and tick off lots of things and say, oh, this isn't right. I need to go and talk to the contractor about this. Um, and developing self is not just CPD, even though that forms a, a large part of it. I think it's um, good to talk about a personal development plan if that's something that you um, in the practice or organization you're working in have to hand i think it's a good opportunity to develop on that certainly um, through the process of being becoming trusted it led me to actually write one for the first time um, and once you've collated all of that and um, referenced everything which takes a long time but i find if you gather all of the relevant information you think you might need as you go along it makes it a lot quicker and um, you'll be invited to professional interview once it's been assessed and um, unfortunately I didn't get to go away from my professional interview because I sat it in I think about a year ago in the middle of lockdown in my spare room so unfortunately I didn't get a, a trip away to Manchester or wherever it would have been held but it was it was actually nicer I think it was a lot more I was a lot more at ease sort of being in my spare room rather than being in a, a hotel in a city I've never been in. Um, but it was, it was uh, it absolutely flew by as an interview. It was just um, me and the two assessors um, having basically having a chat about my application. And um, it was, it might sound 
daft, but it was actually quite an enjoyable process. And then um, I, I didn't have to wait 15 minutes for them to deliberate. I waited three, I think, when they, they called me back in and said, congratulations, you've passed your now MCIT. Um, unfortunately, I didn't really get to go and celebrate either because pubs aren't open, but what can you do? Um, so I think just as a whirlwind, whirlwind tour of how I've got to where I am, and um, I think that covers everything, but the some important resources, I think, for anyone looking to go through there. Um, the chartership process would be the mental match service which SIAT offers, um, which I signed up to I signed up to a year ago and still not had anyone contact me, so please get in touch. Um, similarly, the SIAT Scotland East region, um, there are lots of us who are chartered, um, so we are a very good resource for just chatting to, um, but I think if you can, if you have any chartered architectural technologists within your practice or organisation, they would should they should be a first port of call to um, have a, a chat to just to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, I think that's me. So thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me along and taking the time to listen to my journey in the industry so far. Um, just want to check that everyone can see my screen. Okay. Yep. Screen's yep. coming through nice and clear. Perfect. Um, so my name is Alison Mitchell and I am currently an associate member of the Institute working towards becoming a full chartered member. Um, today I'd like to chat through my career pathway from a student to a professional and the steps that I've taken to progress towards becoming NCIAT. So for me it all began back in 2001 where I commenced work at my father's architectural practice Roy Mitchell Design Limited as a trainee architectural technician. Throughout my youth I was aware of his involvement in the design of housing and residential site layouts and so when I learned he was looking for a junior member of staff to join the practice I jumped at the opportunity. Um, a few months after I started I commenced a day release uh, two-year higher national certificate course at what was the Falkirk Technical College and it's now the Fourth Valley College uh, on construction technology. And then on completion, I commenced a further day release uh, to your higher national diploma course on architectural technology. During these uh, four years at college, I covered numerous topics in regards to building technology, all of which I'm sure you'll be very familiar with. Uh, and I was extremely fortunate to be able to study and work within an architectural practice at the same time, which allowed me to gain on-hand experience and further learn and understand the, the technical requirements to assist with the preparation of um, planning and building warrant applications to successfully obtain approvals. So I graduated from Fourth Valley College in 2005 and became a full-time member of the team as a qualified architectural technician. During my time at my father's practice, we covered a variety of projects ranging from bespoke house designs, listed building conversions, master planning and residential site designs. Um, my father's practice specialises in master planning and residential layout designs for the volume house builders across Scotland. And so at my early stages, I was able to gain more knowledge on the practical side of these designs and an understanding of the the numerous planning and road design standards that are necessary for different local authorities located throughout Scotland. It was here that I developed my love and passion for master planning and placemaking of residential site designs and thanks to my father he taught me all the tips and the tricks of the trade to get me to where I am today. Um, I worked in my father's practice for 10 years with the first four years of employment being a learning curve in conjunction with the college and the remaining six years focusing on assisting in the preparation of master planning and residential site layouts that would progress towards um, gaining planning approvals. I really enjoyed this experience of creating the planning designs which is a specialist field within the industry and so I decided that this was where I wanted to focus my career going forward. So at this point I decided it might prove an advantage for me to work within the architectural design office of one of the volume house builders and so in April 2012 I commenced work with Persimmon Homes East Scotland. 
my uh, my brief on joining the Volume Builder was to take the design process through from inception to obtaining planning approval and then hand over to the construction department. Now, with the Volume House Builder being the client and the architects department forming a part of a multidisciplinary team who all work together, inclusive of engineers and surveyors, this gave me a closer working insight into the project, how the project came uh, financially. The opportunity at Persimmon Homes uh, was very, very beneficial. However, I felt that the variety of design opportunities didn't cover what I had previously been involved in at my father's practice and so realised that the best way forward for my career would be to work within an architectural consultancy practice. One of the large architectural consultants that I knew worked for numerous residential builder clients um, provided me with the opportunity to commence employment with them as part of a larger design team who can assist with the delivery of the whole detailed design package. So I commenced work with EME Architecture and Design Limited in April 2013 as an architectural technician, working closely with the directors in my specialist field to produce the detailed design of site layouts and preparation of planning applications to obtain permission on behalf of the numerous residential developer clients. So for those of you that don't know, EMA is an Edinburgh-based practice that was established in 1998 by Ewan McIntyre. EMA have produced a vast portfolio of projects across architecture, master planning and placemaking and has a very highly skilled team that can cover a range of sectors and scales of projects. I am really lucky to have had the opportunity to continue with my specialist field at EMA, delivering numerous planning consents of varying scales for the various vo volume builders all over Scotland. And I have now been in employment with EMA for eight years. And during this period, I have gained the, the trust and respect of our client base, knowing that I can deliver them a successful layout design that meets their requirements and also obtains planning approval. So it's been a very exciting career to date and within my time at EME I have developed my career from architectural technician through to associate director. So within the team at EME are a number of technicians and technologists and so Ewan gave us opportunity to become members of the institute with the aim of progressing towards full membership. For me, I believe this is an opportunity for me to be recognised for my knowledge and my understanding in my specialist profession with the added bonus of a qualified status. So in 2015, I became an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists. Um, initially, I was a bit apprehensive about the application process as I thought the process would have to cover what a typical architectural technician practices in architectural technology. And so for me, as mentioned earlier, I wondered how this journey would pan out for me, given my profession is in a different field to the norm. However, the best thing I could have done was to attend a workshop hosted by CIATE Scotland at the beginning of 2020. And it was here that I was able to learn from other individuals within our industry that also have a specialist field that have progressed to full membership. And so this gave me the confidence to progress with my membership. And of course, would you believe there's a specialist checkbox all along? So, um, but then COVID happened and I, I basically just focused the, the past year on my workload with an EMA and of course my wellbeing, just given that I've been working from home for the past year now. Um, it's not been easy, but um, made it. So um, I took some time off to focus on my application a few months back, and I hope to submit my application within the coming months that should take me on to the next stage, which would be the interview process, which will give me the opportunity to further demonstrate my competency within my field. So um, I'll let you know how I get on. Um, so filling out the application form is pretty straightforward. Once you get into the swing of Swing of it, you'll actually start enjoying revisiting past and present projects. As my qualification is an HND in architectural technology, I needed to fill out section F, which is stage one educational standards. Um, this forms an essay of up to 5,000 words covering my educational standards and my knowledge and understanding um, and experience of my specialist field. Uh, then I move on to the section G, um, which is the practice standards. And this is where I've been able to demonstrate my practice experience within the field. Um, it has actually been an exciting journey, reliving a number of exciting projects I'm proud to have been part of over the last 20 years. 
and being able to prove that I have an excellent knowledge and understanding of the field that I practice in. Um, so a few hints and tips I would suggest to assist with your progression would be to attend as many membership progression seminars that you can where you'll meet other individuals within the industry and gain knowledge and understanding of their experience that may well be similar to, to the pathway that you've chosen. Um, I would start creating a portfolio of all your work from the offset, um, prepare your application well in advance and uh, start to build up your application based on the key projects that you know really well. I would say just take your time on it and be confident because you will be able to do it. Um, and that's really my journey so far. So um, thank you very much for listening and I hope you've all enjoyed this short pre presentation and it gives you an insight into how I've enjoyed my choice of career. And I would recommend to you all to speak to your peers and listen and learn and given the opportunity as I've had the opportunity it lies for exciting times ahead. Um, I wish you all well with your cho chosen career path and um, thanks again for listening to um, back over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for those presentations. Uh, I've got a different cap on uh, this afternoon. I'm going to talk about the Architects Benevolent Society. Um, Gary Mees, who's here, uh, uh, got me in, involved with this. Uh, so this is my professed presentation in regards to ABS. Um, but it's something that uh, I think is quite uh, relevant to, to talk about, uh, particularly in this uh, current climate. Uh, so hopefully you'll be doing this presentation quite a few times. Um, and if you want me to do a presentation um, to your practices uh, or uh, uh, more widely, I'm happy to do so. But I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to talk about the, the ABS. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't know about the ABS. I've obviously been aware of it for, for years, but um, uh, what they're involved in, how they're involved, how long they've been involved with, um, with uh, the profession is... Uh, quite astounding, but I'll, I'll cover this. There's only nine slides, so I won't be too too long. But um, yeah, but it'll be relevant for you, hopefully. Um, ABS, generally speaking, is is there to, to support you uh, in, in times of needs, I think. Uh, no time has been more difficult than, than the past year uh, for a lot of practices, uh, for no uh, redundancies and so on and the kind of stresses that um, that brings uh, and the ABS is here uh, to help you individually or as practices uh, whatever it may be uh, is open to uh, the list of uh, uh, people here uh, not just um, architects uh, despite the name it's open to ATs uh, assistants anybody really in the in the office at the moment but also families um, uh, more recently students as well Students in the sense of uh, helping with uh, anxiety um, uh, and dealing with uh, those kind of um, stresses, but um, hopefully that's going to uh, expand in the near future if it not hasn't already. So what they can be involved in, um, more generally speaking, is uh, help with the money and debt, uh, housing advice, advice and support uh, on more general uh, issues, mental health issues, disability, uh, mental health and well-being, employment. Um, helping you with uh, get prepared for uh, job interviews and so on. And physical health and disability. Um, so you just really need to give them a call. Uh, it won't necessarily be um, them that will help you, but they'll give you the advice of where to go uh, and how to um, and keep in contact with you, um, generally speaking. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, there's been, been quite a lot of stories I've heard of um, given, given the um, mental health aspect as well um, that uh, it is scary so uh, there is always somebody to talk, turn to and talk to um, and um, for us it's the it's the ABS. Uh, they have a long-standing um, relationship with Anzac to UK and uh, and uh, uh, after an initial consultation um, by phoning the, uh, the ABS number uh, they can give you uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll link um, um, a number, uh, a name and a face to uh, somebody at Anxiety uh, UK, um, which kind of covers these kind of uh, broad areas. One year of membership for Anxiety UK, <coughs> email support, um, helpline, wellbeing assessment, uh, CBT, counselling, uh, clinical hypnotherapy. So it's quite broad, quite uh, uh, a useful exercise um, to undertake. I think. Uh, Switching caps and going into my course leader cap, I think, uh, uh, for the students' perspective, is it'll be quite uh, quite useful. But like I said, this is more more general. 
Um, something I didn't know was uh, it's a 170th uh, birthday as well, 170 years. Um, like I say, I, I knew ABS uh, for, for a number of years, but I, I didn't realise it was 170 years old, um, which is uh, quite phenomenal. And they do a, a whole range of different um, activities and um, you can support them in all sorts of different ways uh, if, if, if all you really want to do is uh, support them. Um, you can do it um, through practice uh, or off your own back. So if you are thinking about any kind of um, activities you want to want to do, and ABS will be um, quite a useful charity to benefit from, from that. What they have been doing is uh, a range of different things. Again, I'm not um, wholly uh, familiar with this. I'm just learning this myself. Um, I think uh, Gary's been more involved with, with this sort of stuff. Definitely, um, considering his uh, Facebook a, a, a account over the past year or so while in lockdown. Um, but uh, bake a better, um, bake the world a better place. Uh, a chicken run. Um, I've seen a lot of chickens in in uh, these uh, uh, things on TV, and I really really realised why. Well, there you go. Uh, time to sketch is a, a, um, a photographic competition going on at the moment. ABS in the, the Scottish. I think it's, it's actually national, um, but it was derived from the Scottish group uh, for ABS and also a few Chris, uh, was Christmas uh, quiz there. I think there are a few more interactive events too. But it becomes part of a, a networking and a support uh, foundation for you once you join. Um, if you want to support it in any sort of way, be it yourself uh, personally or um, the practice, there's different levels. Uh, I think it's a self-explanatory, the pinnacle keys on the foundation as well. So any help in any aid is uh, beneficial uh, to us. Uh, and that's how you contact. Like I said, very, very quick and very sweet. So for me, the, the great takeaway from all of this is that AT as a discipline can be very specialised and CIAT as a body does recognise that these specialities do exist and uh, don't actively seek to exclude any specialisations where you end up finding yourself in your career. Uh, and you may indeed find yourself in a job where you either don't interact with drawings or construction details, or you may think to yourself that you're not doing a job that could be described as a generic architectural technologist. And the thing to remember here is that there is no such thing as a generic architectural technologist. There's always specializations within the discipline at any level. So importantly, CIAT membership uh, is also a, gives you a bit of a leg up in terms of being recognized by many construction schemes. So for example, like the new retrofit uh, schemes, the new retrofit designer schemes, retrofit coordinator schemes, membership of CIAT gives you a leg up in being recognized by the client and local authority and funding mechanisms as a competent professional. Uh, and that's what allows you to kind of streamline some of the some of the process you need to go through to, to undertake some of those roles moving forward. 